Yeah, I don't know. I think ever since I was a teenager, I just had this like, you know, realization that I was going to die one day. This is like one life we get. And, and like, what does that mean? What are the implications? And it, it just felt like I was surprised that people were just living these very ordinary lives and that they weren't like freaking out about that. So I think that's like the, this foundation was just this realization of death. And that led me as a teenager, you know, I, you know, I listened to, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Nirvana and just my world opening up and then experimenting with drugs and a little bit and psychedelics and also reading books about Buddhism and Nietzsche. And I don't know, I, I've just always been tuned to um, trying to figure out why we're here and what's the best way to live this one human life. And, you know, so hopefully that comes out in the books, this one in particular, I mean, I, I got Pilgrim in the title, you know, but hopefully it's like a not too self-serious. It's a comic take on my life as a seeker. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to get to that. I want to have you read because I think like there's a section from the prologue early in the book where you kind of lay it out in a lot of senses, you know, a lot of what you just said is reflected in what I'm going to have you read, but I want to have listeners hear you read that because I think it gives a nice setup for the story that you're telling in, in the redheaded pilgrim. So if you could just read that section. For 12 years, the only thing that's kept my soul from shriveling up completely is that when it's slow, I take these long walks around the business park. The buildings look like Soviet era prisons, but the firs and hemlocks are godly. They rise from the monotony, reaching brilliant green fingers to heaven. Near their peaks, red-tailed hawks fly in circles. As a teenager, I used to ride around in my mom's minivan, looking out the window, imagining what the world looked like before the white people chopped down all the trees. One time, I couldn't help it. I turned to my mom and said, Do you ever feel guilty that our ancestors committed genocide so we could have three Starbucks within a mile of our house? My mom started crying and turned up the radio. Later, we were at the Gap, shopping for clothes. Instead of picking out a pair of jeans, I sat down on the hardwood floor and had a realization that I was going to die one day. So let's talk more about young Kevin Maloney, because I, I relate to this. I think, I think maybe it was my first exposure. I had early exposure to untimely death, and that really knocked me back. You describe yourself as a teenager, like right around the dawn of adolescence, suddenly having this awakening to the reality of death and this confusion over how people weren't more freaked out about it or weren't living their lives in a more direct response maybe to that ultimate reality. Was there exposure to death or any kind of like, uh, did you attend a funeral or was it just, just a basic awareness and you took off from there? I mean, I think one of my earliest memories is that um, my aunt died of cancer when I was around five years old. And I think my parents, you know, were, trying to do the best that, you know, I was five years old. So I think that I was, they kept it for a lot of it from me and it was sort of happening in the background, but I could tell something weird was going on. And like, I rem I still have this memory of my mom, like giving me uh, or showing like a, a, an angel statue and said, Oh, your aunt's an angel now and pointed to this object. And I think, you know, in my kid's five-year-old brain, I was like, wait, none of this makes sense. You know, <laughs> like I just right. couldn't wrap my head around it. So I think I just had this very early memory of, death being kind of strange and my my family was so, sort of vaguely catholic so it, it had to do with like catholic imagery and in jesus and angels and the saints and i just it just all seemed strange i couldn't i couldn't figure out what that was but everybody seemed so sad and i was like oh so they're all saying she went to heaven but you know they don't seem happy about that <laughs> right and i think it just was one of my foundational memories and then you know later in life when i was a teenager and started thinking deeply about the fact that I was going to die one day. That's when, you know, it had all these powerful early childhood associations, I think. Do you think that you were more attuned to death than your peers? I don't know. I think, I mean, it's probably just a personality type. Like, I think everyone has that moment, you know, ha have those moments of looking in the mirror and realizing like, oh, I'm going to die one day. But I think maybe I just have sort of a nervous disposition and like, I'm a little bit of a hypochondriac and I'm a fearful person in a lot of ways. And, and so I think it just, whereas another person might be like, okay, I accept that fact. What's next. And for me, I just like, I still don't accept that fact. I still can't wrap my head around it. So I don't, you know, I don't, I, I think everybody has the thought, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, alter the course of their life having that thought. How have you done during COVID with the hypochondria? 
weirdly, I think it's like almost cured me of my hypochondria. Like, like, uh, I used to obsess about every little lump and bump. And then it's like when COVID happened, I feel like the whole, the whole world joined me in my hypochondria and I'm like, Oh, we're all on the same team now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so to the extent that I still feel like a hypochondriac, uh, I just don't feel alone anymore. So it's actually been really helpful. And I feel like I worry less because everyone's kind of worried, you know? And maybe the untimely death of your aunt from cancer, was that something you think that maybe factored into this awareness that like you could suddenly get sick and die at any time in life or? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think I just like, you know, at a very early age was aware of that. And, you know, uh, my dad passed away from cancer in 2015 and, um, you know, there's just a lot of cancer in my family. So I think it's just this, this, you know, I've, I've never had the idea that, you know, life is forever. There's always this sense that something could turn and everything can change. And I've just always, that's always been right there. So in the book, as a teenager, young Kevin Maloney, the character is named Kevin. Uh, and so he forms or becomes a part of what you call the inevitable death society. Talk a little bit about what that is. Yeah, well, you know, in the book, it's it's uh, a group of kids that get together like once a week, um, you know, a club like chess club or glee club, but they all just sit around and talk about the fact that they're going to die one day. And it's run sort of like an AA meeting where everybody sits in a circle and just confesses their fears. And it's actually loosely based on something that actually happened um, in high school. Uh, some A bunch of my friends were all reading kind of, you know, the existentialist for the first time. And there was a pre-existing club in our high school called uh, the Aloha Theological Society, but it was about to be abandoned. And it had originally been sort of like church based, but we took it over and turned it into like a, what, is, why are we here kind of club? So it's loosely based on something that happened in reality. And, but I gave it a more interesting, you know, name in the book and, I think I did. Like a lot of my friends, when we were juniors and seniors in high school, we were just finding these books and, you know, somebody would come from the library and say, oh, I just found this book by a guy named Fyodor Dostoevsky. And like, we we're like, what's that? And, you know, I don't know. It was just everybody was kind of on a similar path. There's probably four or five or six of us. And, you know, that's what we did instead of uh, whatever everybody, what normal kids are doing in high school. I was going to say, you guys must have been so popular. With the <laughs> oh, yeah. We were... Uh, I don't know, like most of my friends were in bands, so they were like band geeks. And, I, you know, I was just playing an electric guitar in my garage and trying to be Jimi Hendrix. But, you know, we were kind of on that fringe of nerddom where we were like finding our way out, but it involved like smoking pot and growing our hair long, but we definitely weren't cool, you know? Well, the, the other dynamic that I found really funny and touching in your book is this dynamic between Kevin and his parents, uh, where, you know, and I think a lot of artistic people will relate to this, but it's this sense of being sort of an oddball with normie parents. Yeah. That, that was the, I mean, that's the dynamic that's at play, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's what's at play in the book and it, you know, was my experience as a kid, which is that I was given this very safe childhood in a lot of ways. Like I grew up in the suburbs of Portland and had all my knees met and, you know, my parents, like any parents wanted to see me pick a path where I could support myself and have a good life. And, here's their kid, you know, um, basically like, I want to do something totally different that doesn't make any money and it's not safe. I want to be an artist or I want to be a writer. Or I want to be a thinker. I'm going to be a philosopher. And, you know, my parents rightly are like, there's, there's not a paycheck attached to any of those things, you know? Um, but, you know, and, and in the book, I, I, you know, try to use it as like, uh, you know, I'm really inspired by mythology, Joseph Campbell, um, the idea of like the hero's quest and like, you know, someone starting out in kind of a safe, safe world and then something calls them to the other world and then they venture out. And I, I think even at that age, as I was living it, I was seeing my, that happening to my life. I was like making my own myth and mythologizing my life as I was living it. Um, and wait, 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 what age was this at? I mean, that was, you know, starting at like age 17, 18. Um, I ended up going to college right out of high school but that was sort of like a postponement of me like feeling pulled to go travel and see the world and do things that weren't safe and expected of me so i think that's what the tension was with my parents was they were like you know we'll help you you know we've been saving up for you to go to college and and you know pick a college and pick a career and i just want to do the exact opposite and keep all my options open okay um, so there's yeah. a really funny passage in the book. Oh, and another funny passage that I want to have you read 
And it's from the section in the in the novel when Kevin goes away to college, has some psychedelic experiences, kind of blows his own mind, essentially, <laughs> and then writes a letter home. I just want you to read the letter that Kevin writes to his parents from college. This will give listeners a sense of where he and I think you were at psychologically and spiritually at that time. <laughs> Dear mom and dad, I have eaten medicine sent here by aliens. There are fractal patterns everywhere. Thank you for raising me from a zygote. College is good, but there is too much beauty. It is scary learning everything. My philosophy professors are okay, but my best professors grow in the quad, a place like Eden that inspires me to shed my false garments. Speaking of which, I seem to be under arrest. My captors don't have any power, at least not that they're aware of. They haven't eaten medicine. Have you been outside lately? Plants grow there. They have things to teach us. Lately, I'm interested in rhododendrons, but don't forget Douglas Furs, the wizards of the Pacific Northwest. Love, Kevin. <laughs> Please tell me that's an actual letter. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I did not have to write that letter in real life. Uh, it's based on some some real life experiences, but um, I never got caught and held accountable for my actions. So that's a that's a fictionalized uh, idea. If I if I had got caught in my nefarious ways, what? My mindset was back then, which was sort of like unapologetically like, yeah, I'm trying to find the meaning of life in college. Isn't that why I'm here? <laughs> I've eaten medicine uh, that I found growing outside, which, you know, I went for two years right out of high school to a college um, called University of Puget Sound, which in the book I call the University of the Pacific Northwest. But there really were psychedelic mushrooms growing on campus and like kids would just walk around picking them. And I was like, this is <laughs> this is dangerous. Like, how is this a thing? And so I really did just, you know, meet some hippie girls who had made some tea. And, you know, that was my first experience with that. And what was it uh, like? Um, I mean, I think the first time was fairly, I just had a lot of energy. And I was like, I, I really did like run around outside and just like feel really excited. And then I think the second time was more when I had a bigger dose and a more interesting experience, which, you know, I think was just sort of, um, you know, I think I was expecting to have like, uh, to like see hallucinations and things, but it was really more just about being more in my body and in this life and, you know, connected to everything. I just watched the Netflix Michael Pollan series, um, which was fantastic. I haven't read the book yet, but um, how to change your mind. And I think he does a really good job of just talking about at least psilocybin and how it just deepens your connection to this world and, and makes you feel really joyful. And, but I don't know. It's hard to describe. <laughs> it is. But I always think like for me, the most important takeaway from psychedelic experiences is that it just affirms the deep mystery of it all. And, and I think the interconnectivity of everything. Yeah. But I always walk away from a psychedelic experience feeling good and feeling more confused but like yeah. confused in a good way. Like, wow, like this is way stranger. There's much more to this than I'm seeing in my everyday. I think that's pretty common. Yeah. I mean, I think my takeaways that have always been about like, just feeling really connected to the plant kingdom, you know, like I always spend a lot of time with like just trees, touching trees. And then the next day, my takeaway is always like, I should, I should be healthier. I should, I should, my body's a temple. I should eat well. Um, you know, like I, it's funny that it's, you know, I mean, I guess it's kind of being de decriminalized in Oregon, but it's like all the takeaways are like, I want to be a healthier, you know, person. Right. Um, you know, I want to be more intentional about my life, you know? And, What's and bad so, about that? Yeah, exactly. And I don't know, but I, I, I guess I have a different viewpoint it now. Back then I was just, I was literally trying to blow my mind or just shake up the mechanism and now as a 46 year old, I think, I think much more about it from a mental health perspective and, you know, wellness. And, um, I don't think I want to blow my mind anymore, you know, but I want to like be healthy and be thoughtful and be aware of my surroundings and living an intentional life. So do you still do psychedelics every once in a while or no? Um, yeah, but in much smaller doses. Um, yeah, just smaller experiences. I'm not trying to blow my mind anymore, but yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. Very about, occasionally. That's, the thing about it is that, though, like of all, you know, we talk about substances. Uh, you call it drugs. I, I feel like that maybe is a misnomer. I think that psychedelics are, you know, like you're saying, they're plants. It's just yeah. mushrooms growing on the ground. I mean, obviously, there's like LSD in different forms, but psilocybin is literally just a mushroom that grows in the forest or whatever. And 
there's absolutely no part of me that has ever had a psychedelic experience and was immediately like, let's do that again tomorrow. Maybe, <laughs> or maybe when I was in college, but yeah. like, it's not like the horror stories of, that you hear about things like crystal meth or something where you get addicted. It's, it's kind of the opposite. Like I had a, a big psychedelic experience that I write about in my novel and that's the last time I did it. I had no, yeah. I mean, every once in a while, someone will be like, you want to go do some mushrooms? I'm like, eh. I mean, I think I will maybe eventually, but I have no, like, I'm not in a big rush. I sort of did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I took a 20 year break, I think, you know, so like, cause right. I had a kid and life, you know, at that point I didn't want to do anything that messed with my brain. I just want to be a good dad, you know? And, um, yeah, I don't, I, I, I do see like at this point in my life, I see it as much, you know, just, just this, uh, new year's, I started reading books on, I've always had an, a, you know, interest in Buddhism and spent time, some time in my life, like actually like, you know, meditating. I did a weekend retreat where I meditated eight hours, two days in a row. I've never done like a Vipassana or anything like that, but, um, I'm just reading more literature about Buddhism these, this year in particular, and thinking about the connection to psychedelics and it, and to me that there's like a place that they touch that's where um and it's mindfulness right which it's it's interesting because i think mental health is also like bringing more and more mindfulness into the practice of like catching yourself in the moment breaking up your story and then like you know just emptying your brain and seeing the world in sort of original way and i you know i don't think i've come to any conclusions but i know all these things touch somewhere and i think i'm just really interested in whatever that is me as well totally and i think like the way i always describe it to myself is like that psychedelics are an obvious bridge to uh, buddhist meditation or meditation practice it doesn't have to be even buddhist you know i, I think yeah. like to me buddhism is uh someone just said this to me in an email it's like a philosophy of action not a philosophy of the mind or something it's like a it's something to do not something to believe in and i feel yeah, like you know in my most recent psychedelic experiences all of the meditation that i've done i've been doing meditation for my whole adult life was extraordinarily helpful and yeah it made what could have otherwise been maybe terrifying like totally comfortable <laughs> yeah i think i'm I mean, I'm a terrible meditator in the sense that I only do it when I'm in crisis, you know, <laughs> like I, I think the point is to check in every morning and, you know, or have a, a regular practice, but I tend to like swoop in when I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm like in a bad way right now. I'm going to use this to kind of stabilize, but um, I'm just very aware lately of like trying to practice mindfulness on the fly, you know, like almost meditating in real life. One thing I do a lot of not when it's, I live in Oregon and Portland and the winters are just brutal here. Um, not snow, it's just rain gloomy, but, uh, in the summer, especially during COVID, I would go for, you know, three or four walks every day. There's a beautiful Douglas fir forest right by my house. And I just go there every day and just walk and walk and walk. And a lot of times that's where I would do my editing. I'll like read something into my phone and listen to it on my headphones. But, um, when I wasn't doing that, I'm just like walking around looking at the trees. And for me, that's almost like, uh, how I prefer to do my, you know, mindfulness these days is just out in the world, going for a walk, noticing things, trying not to think and like play out some story or what am I worried about what I have to do tomorrow, but just kind of notice things as I walk. And so I think that's, yeah, I guess that's what I'm more interested in. And, um, and especially when it comes to like fear or like trying new things or things I'm scared of, like slowing down and breathing and being like, okay, like, what am I scared of here? You know, if it's, if it's something good, I think it's interesting just like slow down, catch whatever that fear is and just sort of like breathe and be, be, be present. I think life becomes much more interesting that way. Maybe more fun, I, I guess. More manageable. But yeah. I think what you're talking about is, is right on. I mean, I feel like meditation is, I think, predominantly associated with sitting on a cushion completely still with your eyes closed. Like that's the mode that I think most people would picture when you say the word. But the truth is that if you're really doing the practice you're doing it all the time no matter what you're doing and i think it's slow progress i don't think it's i mean occasionally you'll hear about somebody who has some you know magical satori experience after like one week at a retreat or something but usually it's a long slog right yeah i mean that's my understanding is you know and i love this idea i think a few buddhist teachers have said it that like enlightenment's easy like if you sit, you know, for an hour, you'll probably have a moment of being enlightened and then it goes away, you know? Right. And, and what good did that do you, you know, like for one, maybe for, you know, five seconds, you didn't have a thought you were in your body, you were breathing 
And in that moment you were enlightened and then it's gone. But it's like, it'd be like saying, oh, I went to the gym and I, you know, I, I lifted weight, you know, did five reps. Okay. During those five reps, you were like, you know, in your A game, but then like, if you don't ever lift weights again, you're not going to be healthy, you know? So I think, I, I think it's much more like, you know, um, yeah, maybe there is some Satori where it just clicks in forever after your, you know, uh, something changes for you. But I think, you know, my, my understanding is that for most people, there's no aha moment other than maybe an aha moment where you make a commitment to sort of exercising every day or meditating every day or being more mindful. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, a muscle you flex. That's, that's what, it. What about the book? Like what Buddhists have you been reading this year? Um, I just got uh, the book, uh, The Art of Happiness, which is like an interview with the Dalai Lama, which has been really interesting. My kind of go-to is um, When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron. Really. So a lot of like Tibetan Buddhists. Um, and then I started rereading um, a book by, Suz uh, what's his name? Shunru Suzuki, uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. So yeah. those are the three I kind of like, you know, when I'm not reading fiction and just need a break, that's what I, that's what I read. Right I'm now, the same way. Yeah. I like have this. People are always like, what podcast do you listen to? And I'm like, do you really want to know? Like <laughs> I have been listening to, it's essentially an audio book because it's transcribed lectures by this, um, this uh, forest monk from Thailand named Ajahn Chah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ajahn Chah. Mm -hmm. but there's a book of his that is basically, that was published after his death. That was just a collection of talks that he had given. And so the podcast that I listened to is one of his descendants or whatever, reading it from cover to cover. And it's so rich in my view. Like for me, it's like so rich and so helpful that I've listened to it. Pro I'm probably now on my sixth turn. Like mm -hmm. I just listened to it from start to finish which takes me like, you know, six weeks. And then I start it again. Yeah. And every time I re-listen to it, I'm like, oh, I totally missed most of this. <laughs> yeah. It's just wild. But uh, I listen to a lot of that stuff and I feel like it's some sort of balance between the fiction that I write and the fiction that I read and whatever I'm doing in my daily life. And it's just a nice way to sort of remind myself. And what's crazy is like how many reminders I need. Like I need yeah. to remind myself every day. Like that's basically the deal. If I don't, I can easily get lost. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of repetition, reading the same books over and over, you know, um, especially like, yeah, books about mindfulness. I mean, I think every time you read it, it's just going to remind you like hit the reset button. But I mean, I do that with fiction too. Like the books I love, I read them over and over and over again because I'm trying to learn something. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if every writer is that way or every person is that way. But like, I, I end up reading far less and more that I read deeply of the same books. And then I listen to a book I've already read twice. I'll listen to it on an audio book and just try to like really get into the rhythm of why it works or what, what moved me about it. I'm just, um, so I'm a big fan of listening audiobooks, that kind of thing. What about, yeah, I feel like, uh, like there are certain books for writers, maybe certain books for all of us who love to read, but for writers in particular, I think there are books that you, that really, you know, uh, you feel connected to that you treat as kind of desk references, uh, desk references almost. They're like dictionary. You know, you have your dictionary, you have your copy of uh, Slaughterhouse Five or whatever it is. You know, that's like, one of mine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because I think you mentioned Vonnegut in your book, and I yeah. definitely can feel I can feel that DNA in the book as as a Vonnegut guy myself. So, what are some of the books uh, that you feel this way about, like fiction fictional books? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Slaughterhouse Five is one of those books I read every couple of years, and um, I've listened to the audiobook of it. And I, yeah, it's I think that was just the first book that felt that way to me, and just sort of like opened something up for me, like, oh, I think this is what I want to do. Whatever Vonnegut's doing there, and I think that can get a lot of people in trouble because Vonnegut nobody can do what Vonnegut does. He just has such a unique voice. But I I, I do think it led me to being a more like um voice oriented writer where i'm really trying to be like funny on the page and like have a have a voice that hope, hopefully comes across um dennis johnson's jesus his son is one i li listen to over and over and over just because i mean i think that's like so many writers favorite book but it, it's like uh he just does things that i think um no one else has done as well his like his like turn from like these deadbeats who are like committing crime to just the funniest dialogue. And then suddenly this paragraph that just feels like a beautiful poem about the landscape of Iowa and just like how he can move seamlessly from one to the next. So that's one. And I, I kind of have a soft spot for Richard Brodigan because I, you know, like, I don't think he's a great writer, but he's, he's from the Pacific Northwest Tacoma and he's really playful and, and fun and light. And I think he reminds me of just like, you know, also trying to be like, 
light heart like fiction doesn't have to be heavy fishing fiction can be fun you know and i think that's something a lot of people lose lose track of well i think what you're talking about and what you're up to in your work is trying to uh interweave the dark and the light you know that's obviously what vana gets up to and to some degree i think what dennis johnson is up to but something that i think you are explicitly aspiring to in cult of loretta and in the redheaded pilgrim is to be a funny literary novelist i i don't know i think about this endlessly because i have a similar aspiration and i have great reverence for books that pull it off and they're really to me and i'm you know i obviously have my limited scope of reading but there aren't that many of them and i want to dig in a little bit more about what it takes to be funny on the page like what have you learned having written two books in this mode yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. I think a lot of a lot of my friends are surprised. Like, I think my wife is way funnier than I am. Like, like me too. In, in our relationship, she is the funny one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and let, and then we hang out with like some of our friends, and they're just like so smart. Their jokes are just like coming in real time, and like I'm belly laughing, and I'm just can barely keep up. But I, I so I, I do think like being funny on a on the page is maybe different than being funny in real life. Because like my friends are always like, "Why are you?" So, why is your book so funny? You're not this funny. And I, but I think it's just like, uh, I think when I hang out with funny people, I'm paying attention. I'm like listening to them and I'm sort of like studying. I'm like, Oh, that's funny. Like, and, and then, but I think turning that into, I think when people write a lot of the times they feel like they're like, they feel like, Oh, I'm talking to literature. And I, you know, like this is where important thoughts happen is in a book. And I, to me, like, I think humor is the highest form of intelligence. And I think that humorous literature, like you said, is, is like a rarity, like catch 22 is another book that's just like funny and, and wild and whimsical, but doing it in a smart way. And I, so I think just at some point, you know, I spent a long time writing things that weren't, weren't funny. I was like, you know, trying to write my bad Raymond Carver knockoffs. And then, um, uh, you know, at some point I, I published something online that, that was just a little more light and whimsical and humorous. And suddenly like it got published right away and people, there was just like a response online. And I was like, oh, like maybe there's something there for me. And I don't know what it was. And I just started moving deeper into whatever that voice was. And it just all of a sudden felt like, oh, people are responding to this. And I feel like I'm finding what I'm supposed to, the way I'm supposed to write, you know, and um was I, this, it, wait was this before cult of loretta or after this must have been before it was before it was like in the year leading up to that though like cult of loretta was pretty early for me in having found that voice um whatever that was and and so i published yeah probably like four or five six stories in that voice and then the novella just sort of like came out by accident really fast i wrote it in like 10 days it was just sort of like it's a really good book Oh, thank you. I think you, I think you des uh, describe, or you talk about the book in the redheaded pilgrim and you say like 500 people read it or something like that. And I'm like, I was one of them. I'm such a fan <laughs> of cult, cult of Loretta people listening, you know, not only should read pilgrim, but also that one. And, you know, you're talking about something landing on a voice. And I think when it comes to writing, like, you know, I don't want to sound too precious about this, but this is the best way I, I can think of to define it is that, you know, it's comedic and it's also high art. So what I'm talking about here is not just like writing jokey fiction or just trying to be like goofy on the page. What we're, what we're talking about here is trying to like marry that high art impulse with silliness and with like the dark with the light. Yeah. And when I see it done well, I think the word that comes to mind is voice. Like it's a specific kind of voice that a person has to arrive at that is uniquely theirs and that is carried from page one to the end of the book. And that is really fucking hard to land on, to land on a funny voice, <laughs> to yeah. master it. Like I'm getting ready to, uh, it's going to come out. Like these episodes are going to come out close together, which is good because I'm getting ready to talk to Hunter Thompson, a uh, Hunter Thompson biographer. Oh and yeah. He is a writer for me that did it. Like he, yeah. he didn't do it across his entire oeuvre. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like he kind of got it, I think perfected and, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Yeah. But the the reason I love this biography so much is because it really gets into the language of Gonzo 
And like, he came up with his own like dialect, right? These certain words that he fixates on, like fear and loathing and mm -hmm. pig, pig fucker and you know, <laughs> all these things that are like, as soon as you see them on the page, you're like, oh, that's him if you've read his work, you know? And so it just brought, I, I think, into high relief, the necessity of really getting into the language and finding your way to that funny voice that's just yours. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I don't know how you did it, but you, you did it. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I, it's, I, I read a, an interview with Dennis Johnson where he, somebody was like, who, who, what's your favorite, you know, book to read? And he said, and he said something like, well, my own, because when I read it, I see all of my favorite writers are in there, you know, and I see what I stole from them. I, I'm probably misquoting it, but, and, and I do think like, you know, I probably have, you know, Hunter S. Thompson's probably one of those where I read Fear and Loathing a dozen times, you know, and, and I think whatever my voice is, was me gravitating towards a certain type of writer, just trying to rip off their voice. But if you're ripping off five people at the same time, then maybe that's just where you stop sounding like any one of them and, and your own voice comes out, you know, mm. and and but now I have like little moves I've found that I've used in stories and novels. And I'm like, am I allowed to still use that move? Is that my move now? Like, do yeah. I just keep doing it? Or do I have to keep finding new moves? Like that move was hard to find. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it yeah, took yeah, me yeah. a decade to get that. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I just, I read deeply. I, th I, I agree. There's very, there's not enough like high art, funny writers and the ones I found, I read deeply. I'm always looking for new ones. Um, and when I find one, I just read it over and over and over again to figure out why it works. Cause it's my favorite thing to read. And so I, I, you know, primarily what I'm doing as a writer, I'm trying to write a book I would want to buy and read and be glad I, I read. So. And what about like the dealing with the darkness? Because this book has got a real darkness to it and a real sense of human suffering, you know, at the core of it, the Kevin character in this book is struggling to find his way toward a spiritual understanding of his existence to develop, I think, a relationship with death that I guess you might characterize as healthy, or at least yeah. not overwhelmingly terrifying every second of the day. He's also moving his way through a series of relationships and trying to figure out how to be in a healthy relationship with a woman and how to deal with sexuality and the body. And then you know, eventually the book gets into fatherhood, which I think is really the deepest heart of the book. You know, that's yeah. where I think the shit gets real, you know, right? As, yeah. it, as it does when you become a parent, all of a sudden it's like, woof, you know, like the, in some sense, like the jokes are over, like now what do I do kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So uh, I, I guess like, I, I want to talk more about the, like the way that as a human being and as a writer, we come into confrontation with this darkness, right? This confusion, this pain and suffering and insecurity. And then there's this impulse to like make jokes, yeah, <laughs> you know, so that the reader isn't bludgeoned with, you know, my shit. I've had that, you know, we all have that. Like, do I really need to share all this or do I really need to go here? And at the same time, I feel like sometimes if you get too silly, you can undermine what would otherwise be effective. You know, the reader's going, actually, no, I actually want you to talk about this stuff. Like, stop the jokes. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like there's a balancing act going on on the page. Uh, do you, did you run up against that? Am I speaking about something that you relate to? Yeah, I mean, and I think maybe in, in Cult of Loretta, I felt like I had my foot on the gas, like the whole time, just like one joke after another. And and I really loved writing that book. And it was really f like so fun. And but I think with this, this, with, uh, the redheaded pilgrim, I, I just, I was like, can I push myself to write like closer to my real life? Can I push myself to writing about vulnerable things? Like, you know, bad things that have happened or that are adjacent. It's, you know, cause it's not, it's, it's not a memoir. Like I, I made stuff up, but I made stuff up that feels true. That feels close to what really happened. And, and I think that just even that degree to which it's fiction gave me a lot of room to sort of like primarily like judge the character named Kevin Maloney and, and sort of, ex, you know, show all of his flaws and put them all on the table. And, and I think that, I guess that's like the, the, my goal as a writer is to take this voice I found, which is funny and zany and weird. And a lot of the stories I've written have been about drugs, but I'm like, can I push that voice into the realm of like 
yeah, being married, having a child at 25, like the struggles of being a new parent and, and what would that look like? So I think in a way, the, the redheaded pilgrim, the first half works as momentum, both for me as a writer to like build up to that moment, but also for the reader, hopefully where they're like, okay, here's this innocent guy traveling around trying to find the meaning of life and kind of being an idiot. What, what happens when that person is suddenly a parent and that like life is real because I feel like that's what happened in my life. And I wanted to like, you know, really take someone on that journey so that the second half is a very different book in a lot of ways. But I, you know, I hope the voice is still there. The jokes are still there, but they're a little more spread out and there's a little more room for darkness. And um, I also think that like laughter, it like touches, you know, crying and sadness. Like they're all, you know, that's why I think so many comedians are such depressed people. Like those two instincts are very like, you know, two sides of the same coin. And I think it runs in my family too. Even when my dad was, you know, sick with cancer, there were times my mom and I were just cracking jokes in the hospital room. Cause what else are you going to do? Like you cry for only so long, then you run out of tears and then you start making jokes. Cause I, and I don't know what that impulse is. You know, I don't know if it's healthy or not, but it's definitely something I have. It's alchemy. Yeah. I mean that to me, I think it's like you say, you say it's a high form of intelligence. I agree because it's born of suffering. And if you can take suffering, if you can take darkness and pain and difficulty and grief and dread and all the stuff that comes with being human, and then you can turn that into laughter, well, that's doing something useful with it, in my view. And I got to say, too, like in defense of autofiction, because I love it. I like to write it and I like to read it. And it often gets shit upon or shadow yeah. you know and i just think that there should be room for everything i'm not uh, only interested in auto fiction i don't you know piss on genre fiction or anything like that i think there should be room for everyone to do their thing but for anybody who thinks that auto fiction is somehow cheating or that it's you know i don't know uh, navel gazy i mean i guess it is to some extent navel gazy because it's about your own life. But if it's like somehow thought of as being easier or it's thought of as being obnoxious, it's really fucking hard to look at yourself like that. Yeah. <laughs> and to take the worst moments of your life or the most difficult stuff of your life and to turn it into a narrative that other people can enjoy. And then on top of that, to turn it into a narrative that despite its darknesses and tediums, uh, it can be funny, you know, I don't know. I just want to give you a shout because I know what, the, what it's like to have to sit with that for a long time and to try to render it in a way that's like palatable for others, because it's very easy to fuck it up. And it's very easy to sort of trick yourself into thinking, oh, this is great, but it's really only great to you because you've somehow externalized it. That yeah. alone, that alone can feel good, but it's not enough to make it a book. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, I notice that sometimes, you know, I, I like reading, I'll read a book in the introduction where the author, you know, a reprint or something, and the author kind of tells you about the writing of the book and I'll read the introduction and then I start the actual book and I'm like, the introduction was better. Like when you were just talking to me. Slaughterhouse-Five. I mean, yeah, the first chapter is the best chapter. It's a great book, but like that first chapter just kills me. Um, yeah, I wish it would be that whole, I wish that would be the whole mode for that book almost, you know? Yeah. Just, I love when Vonnegut is just talking to me as Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> yeah, and I think he, yeah, he found something there. And and so like, I, I guess, you know, I'm still trying to understand even what the word autofiction means. I feel like it just came out of nowhere and everybody has an opinion about it. And I'm like, but people have been writing their own lives slightly disguised for forever. Like, isn't that what most fiction is? So like, why not just come out of the closet and it's just, okay, here's a character. And, you know, people have been asking me a lot, okay, did that happen? Did that happen? And I'm like, okay, I'm happy to talk about that. But it's really interesting to me that there's like a real obsession of like, which part is true and which part isn't. And I'm like, well, it's all mixed up together, you know, like it's... um and it's mostly true and, and the parts that aren't true, I, I just, uh, I found a different way to tell something that happened that got cut to the heart of how I felt at the time. And it, feel, it feels more true than if I was trying to get everything perfect in a memoir, you know. Um, I don't understand anybody. I mean, I get the only way that I can understand memoir is if somebody kept like a really careful diary of their lives and they're drawing on that source material. Otherwise, to me, it's all autofiction. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I guess you give yourself more latitude, but. 
I just think that, you know, everybody, like you say, is writing some disguised version of their own lives, even if they're writing like surrealist, a surrealist thriller or some sci-fi thing. Yeah. And I think maybe the way that I understand my own affection for auto fiction, it might have something to do with my spiritual orientation towards life and this desire for moment to moment awareness and, you know, the more Buddhist kind of aspects of my worldview. When I'm reading auto fiction, I feel like somebody is in direct confrontation and there's no layering. There's no barrier. You know what I'm saying? I feel like they're yeah. trying to sort of tear down the disguise. They're taking the mask off. That's the way to put it, maybe. But you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that. It's not that I don't think there should be room for everything. If somebody wants to deal with their shit by writing about aliens and like a trip to another planet or something, great. But I, I sort of love it when it's like, no, I'm just going to actually tell you what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I'm hungry for that, you know, because I feel like there's so much bullshit between people i'm not talking about in literature though i guess there is but i'm just talking about in the day-to-day -day, like small talk superficial nonsense that we deal with and how much the actual lived reality of our lives is often sort of shunted away or you know hidden behind whatever you know instagram filter we want to use or whatever it is you know what i'm saying yeah. so oh yeah auto fiction for me is like okay now i'm actually dealing with somebody who's telling me what's going on with them that is a great relief to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's exciting to me as, as a reader when, yeah, when, so, when someone's like, I think there's a temptation when you're a writer and you're writing a novel and you're thinking about plot and what are the characters going to do here? You're getting, it's getting further and further away from yourself. And there's something about like making your own life, the anchor, even if you stray from that that i think keeps it honest in some way or at least that's that's how i see it and and when i find books where i'm most excited sometimes by writers who write autobiographically but nothing big happens it's it's almost just like they're inviting you to into like a week in their life and they're you know there might be a scene where they're watching netflix and it shouldn't be interesting as a book and yet somehow a good voice a good writer can make that funny or interesting or enlightening and I think I'm interested in pushing deeper into that direction as a writer, you know, to like, what, what does it mean to really invite someone into your present moment and how you think about each thing moving through the day? And I don't know, that's fascinating to me. I can't get enough of it. Well, and I think on a related note, like this, there's a level, I think what we're talking about is candor and an aspect of your book that I found uh, really well done and interesting has to do with it's descriptions of the body and the grotesque and sexuality. Yeah. Like it, it doesn't hide from any of that. And it felt kind of, now that I've talked to you and you mentioned Catholicism, there's something Catholic about that, <laughs> but there's also something psychedelic about it. If I could put it that way or Buddhist or whatever, just like this awareness of like, what the fuck is this body? And like, yeah. Oh, like we poop and we have sex. And it's so weird, you know, it's really weird when you think about it. And I think that, your book and the way that you're describing Kevin in relation, I think in particular to his own body and into to women really brings that into focus. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, and it's part, and it's funny too. The body can be funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that word grotesque. I, you know, I, I went to college for two years and then I dropped out for like a decade. And when I finally went back um, to get an English degree, I took a class called literature, the grotesque. And it was like the first time I'd read Flannery O'Connor and a handful of people who just like, always have like, you know, like people with like deformities or, you know, like the body is very strange in Flannery O'Connor, you know? And, and I think, and I've always felt that way about my body. I mean, I'm six foot six. I have bright red hair. I'm just gangly. Like I'm a, like when I walk into a room, like for better or worse people, like I, I take up space, you know? And so I think I've always like felt a little like, you know, and especially as, as a teenager, I didn't feel at home in my body. It, it grew too fast. And I did, you know, a trip in the hallways and I was just had braces and it was just a mess. <laughs> and, uh, and I think I step that that's still inside of me. I'm still that person, you know, like in some ways I've, I've like become more comfortable with it. I see it with a sense of humor, but I still feel like, what am I doing in this body? It's so strange. And, and maybe that's tied into like Buddhism and the psychedelic experience is like snapping back into like 
not taking anything for granted, right? Like you're suddenly aware of like, oh, this is so weird. This is so strange. <laughs> right. And like I like I didn't lose my virginity until I was like 21 or something, which felt like forever back then. You know, like I was, I felt like I was the last one. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I want to stop you because every <laughs> once in a while, I'm talking to a friend of mine and like, oh, I lost my virginity at 13 or 14, and I'm just like the fuck are you talking about like <laughs> yeah. how can I, that that is in my view that is way too early like i think back to my own i mean listen to each their own but it just feels to me like when i was 14 i was not ready to have i didn't even know what i was doing you know what i'm saying i was barely pubescent that seems yeah. crazy to me so i don't know like kudos yeah i, I, I was later too losing i mean i think head. it was like probably totally normal but back then i think you know when, when you're a 21 year old man you're just like oh this is like how have i not done this you know like what is wrong with me um, and, and so I think, yeah, I just like, I don't know. I've always felt really innocent that way. So like when I finally did lose my virginity, it just like blew my mind. The whole thing. I was just like, it's so strange. Like bodies are so weird. And I guess I, I, I'm still in touch with that, that, that thought, you know, but like there's nothing weird, weirder than a human body that we are like sentient creatures who are trying to have this like infinite experience. And then we got to go brush our teeth and go to the bathroom. Like, it's just, it's a, it's a strange thing. Well, there, there, there's great passages in the book. Uh, forgive me. I'm trying to remember which uh, female character it is. Is it Angela? Who does he lose his virginity to? Or like where he's like crying, like they're getting. Wendy. Big... Yeah. Wendy. That's right. Sorry. That's uh, all right. But it's like, he, you described this Kevin character being like, like brought to tears because the experience is so intense. It's so emotionally yeah. intense. And I thought that was like both true to life, but also like very funny, yeah. especially thinking of it in the context of like first experience, you know, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. And I think there's like, you know, I, I'm someone who maybe like, you know, I'm, I'm 46. I grew up in the era of like playing football and being like taught to be masculine and macho where you're supposed to hide all of that. But I just, it just, I just never could pull it off. I could never pull off the macho thing. So I just threw it out the window and I wear my like anxiety on my sleeve. And, and so I, you know, I think maybe probably everybody has these thoughts, but then like the, the story overrides it of like, no, no, I got to look tough and cool. And I just was never very good at that. So I was like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to like, if I cry because this because I've had sex and it's so strange to me, then you know, like I, I think I've always felt that way. I don't know. I don't know if I actually cried in real life, but like, you know, I, I wanted to have this character who's just, you know, not hiding anything because he can't. He just he, he he can't manage to like hold it together. And maybe that's interesting because we're all feeling those things. We're just kind of correcting it in the moment. Yeah, I relate so much. I think that writers, maybe in general, but maybe particularly writers who are oriented the way that we are. Like for me, socially, I have often, I think back in college, you know, being around, when I was really around like a peer group in a concentrated way, I would often feel a sense of alienation or like looking around and feeling like alienated and confused, you know, like heightened, confused, like, wait a minute, everyone seems like they're really sure of what's going on. <laughs> like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I guess yeah. I just felt like dumber or something. And I think, who did I just talk to? I've talked, I think I just had this conversation on the show where I think like, I was like, yeah, I think I'm like a mediocre intelligence and I'm more confused. And that's why I'm a writer. It's not that I have yeah. like some heightened insight or something. I think I'm like struggling and I have to write and read just to sort of keep track of what the fuck is going on and try to make my way through. <laughs> yeah. And I think if a writer thought they had the answers, that would be the most insufferable novel ever. Right. Like, cause it, what's more, what's more relatable is, is, is that every year you become more and more confused, you know, like you might develop more skills and know how to do certain things better and be slightly more competent. But um, I think we're all being honest, like we don't know what's going on. Like nobody knows what's going on, you know? And I think at some point I realized that I, I had the same feeling in junior high and high school, like, Oh, everybody else knows what's going on. And I'm the only one who doesn't. <laughs> and then at some point in my twenties, and I used to be painfully shy, like so shy that like I was supposed to do the announcements on the intercom one morning and I hid under a table and like they were trying to pull me to go do this thing. But uh -huh. it was like so vulnerable and I was just shaking. And that's where I like come from. But I, I think in my 20s, I was like, oh, everyone is terrified. No one knows what they're doing. And that was such a liberating thought that I, I don't know. I think it, something shifted in me and I felt like I could be a little more brave and a little more me. And because I was like, what do I have to lose? Everyone else is feeling self-conscious and ridiculous. 
so why not just put it out there and if i fail i fail you was know? that a, was that a psychedelic it's uh, probably yeah. <laughs> um probably i don't yeah i don't know a lot was you happening were, you were at like, the same I, time. I, was, I was walking naked through the quad <laughs> suddenly uh, yeah. yeah suddenly it came to me but that's a good you know that's a good point and i think that maybe there is a part of me and maybe there's a part of people who are into creative self-expression especially writerly expression who want to start like articulating that and having conversations about it and other people might not be ready. <laughs> yeah. I think there was a part of me that like wanted to keep a running commentary or like pull someone to the side and be like, okay, so this is what's going on. And everyone else is like sort of just at the party, you know, and like yeah. experiencing it. So it wasn't time, but maybe, that, maybe <laughs> that, maybe that's why we turned to the page, right? That's why yeah. we sit there trying to put it down. And then the weirdos who want to experience that will find the book, you know, the ones who, supposed, who want to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what about capitalism? Like this is something that I think comes up over and over again in literary fiction, probably because it's, you know, unavoidable, but also because I think people who are drawn to writing literary fiction don't fit into traditional modes. You know, we are not round pegs, writerly yeah. people. And I feel like the Kevin in the book that you're describing, his peripatetic journey, the bouncing around the country, the, the different girlfriends and the struggles to sort of uh, sort himself out in relation to women. And then also like to try to sort himself out in relation to how to support himself and make his way in the world. This is something that I relate to. And it's something that I think most writerly people and maybe most people in general relate to, but I don't know if you've ever had envy for people who have a kind of linear path. I often think of like doctors and lawyers, just because it's obvious examples where it's like, well, you just get through these hoops educationally. And if you pass the tests and do your residency or whatever, then you're a doctor and you're sort of like, you know, whether or not you're happy in it or whether or not you're like making a bazillion dollars, you are making a good living and you are sort of, wow. Oh, What's the word? There's a sense of confirmation and a sense of authority and uh, I guess prestige. You see what I'm saying? You're sort of yeah. like, a, you're like a made man or a made woman. And in general, people think highly of you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that like when you're a little kid and you read, you know, kids books, um, I, those are, I think it's Richard Scarry is that his name where it shows all the animals and they all have the different jobs and it's like firefighter and policeman. But like one of them is like the artist, the painter or something, or the writer who's up in their den, you know, smoking a pipe. And I'm like, if you, if you like find your calling and it's, you know, engineer, like great, like wonderful, like what a great thing to want to be and to feel a sense of deep satisfaction. Like, then yeah, you go to you you go to school, you get the degree, you get the job, and you're and you get to do what you love every day, and that's a wonderful life. Like I, I respect that, and um, and I don't look down on it at all. But like, if you like look in your heart of heart, and you're like, I'm an artist, or I'm a philosopher, or I'm a I'm a writer, you know, that path immediately becomes really messy because it means you're gonna have to do something else to pay the bills, maybe for the rest of your life, probably for the rest of your life, and like then the struggle is after you put in the eight hours, it's doing something that, you know, hopefully you find something that doesn't suck your essential energy. And then you sit down to do the thing you love, you know, how much energy is left for that and how long can you sustain being that in this world that doesn't really pay? Um, you know, if you want to get paid, you got to move to, you know, move to LA and write for TV, which is great, but it's, it's a little different than like being like, I want to have my vision, my thing, you know, my revelation. And I want to write that thing, whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's like any, any kind of writer who wants to do their own thing is immediately having a adversarial relationship with capitalism. Cause it's like your enemy, cause it takes up time to make money, to pay for things. So. And energy, like you said, yeah. all, all that vital energy drain and you're either doing it after work or before, in which case you're getting up at 4am or whatever the hell it is, you know, and it's just, it's not easy. And I relate, I related to it on the page. And I think it's also very funny. It is, there's something funny about trying to fit into a world when you just don't fucking fit. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like most people who are in like literary fiction and poetry and literary nonfiction for the long haul have a similar feeling about themselves and about their relationship to like the broader culture. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's the only calling that immediately, like, separates you from the normal way to live a human life. But, I, you know, th there's a handful of them that immediately just mean you're going to be an outcast. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I like, and I tried to find, and th this is this is in uh, The Red-Headed Pilgrim, like, because it's pretty close to the truth. But, like, I tried to find, like, what's the job that makes sense for um, for a writer? Okay, I'll be a high school English teacher. And I really tried to do that. I was, like, a student teacher for a semester. And and that was also when I was, like, going through a divorce. So I would, like, teach for half the day, and I'd have to leave on lunch break and just cry and just, like, sob. And <laughs> even, even if I wasn't going through that, like, I just, you know, I saw that, like, the good teachers, it wasn't that they were, like, you know, I wanted to talk to these, you know, th these sophomores about like why, you know, like my favorite writers were so good, but that's not what they were teaching in high school. They were like teaching just basic comprehension of how to like re understand something, a paragraph you just read. And yeah. the best teachers were not like deeply engaged with the work. And that was fine. You know, that's, it's just, and so I immediately like quit that and got a job working at a teddy bear factory, which like just seems so random, but like, <laughs> I was like, okay, this is, I think closer to my heart i don't know why but like it feels appropriately like a weird job that i'm having that fits my path you know and immediately i felt like much more at home at the teddy bear factory than I, I did trying to be an english teacher well i'll say too teaching unless you're very lucky doesn't pay shit i taught yeah. for five years and if you i mean bless teachers you know but i was an adjunct at a community college for five years and the workload versus the compensation is criminal it's absurd. I yeah. was getting like when you started to parse it out, I was making like nine dollars an hour to teach college, and it was a full load, you know. And so, I don't know how what the solution is, but there's been endless hot takes on social media about the way that this society te te uh, treats teachers, not just college teachers either, but high school teachers as well. Like it's a it's a heck of a lot of work for very little pay. And oh yeah they should be making as much as doctors and lawyers like if we wanted to have a healthy society you know like and we just don't and it makes no sense i just i just i don't know i sort of i bristle so much about all the lip service paid to how we love our teachers and we you know there's all that bullshit like people yeah. love to sing the praises of teachers but they don't want to actually pay teachers you know a, a, a living wage or like a better than a living wage like if we really value our children's education the way that we say we do why are we paying you know, their elementary school teacher, like $38,000 a year and asking her to buy supplies for her kids out of her own pocket. Yeah. That shit drives me crazy. So anyway, uh, very relatable and very funny. You actually did work at a teddy bear factory because that's in the book. And I was wondering. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, quite as ridiculous as I make it out uh, in the book, but uh, yeah, it was a strange place to find myself. I worked in a call center and at, uh, in real life, I worked at the Vermont Teddy Bear, uh, Vermont Teddy Bear Factory and uh, took phone calls and fulfilled orders and eventually became a manager there. And I did that for like maybe a couple of years. Wow. Um, you got yeah, to manager was, in two years. Look I got to manage. Oh yeah. I was on the <laughs> upward path at the teddy bear factory. <laughs> they saw something in you. Yeah. Like this guy, he, but I, you know, they, they also say that tall people often have uh there's like a like they have more executive authority like i think just like biologically right like okay six, six foot six you walk in everyone's like okay yeah the, ch the chief is here <laughs> yeah and i think you know i was working customer service and i do like i could take a phone call where someone was just screaming and you know just uh -huh. talk to them real slow and like right. you know i'm that i had good customer service skills apparently yeah yeah i get that like trying to diffuse somebody in fact, like I, I will sometimes in my lower moments be the guy on the other end of things where I'm calling to bitch, you know, on a customer service call. <laughs> and I always have respect for somebody who can diffuse me. <laughs> you ever been caught in those moments where you're like kind of in asshole mode and then somebody's like, okay. And they start talking to you like you're like six years old and you're like, all right, all right, sorry. You know? And you yeah. Know. I'm too many times. I'm like the guy making that phone call. Who's like mad about some product I received and I'm just yeah. talking to some poor person and I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, <laughs> this it, person is just doing their job. No, uh, I will put so them. Yeah. And you know, like usually they're like recording those calls for quality assurance or whatever. Okay. They'll tell you the recording it. And I, I, in my worst customer service call experiences, I'll suddenly be like, I feel bad for you. I was like, you're, <laughs> you're, you're a human shield. I'm like the decision yeah. makers who are responsible for this you know, are using you as a human shield <laughs> and I'll start to like, I'm trying to be like, you know, kind to them and maybe slightly like darkly funny. And it just comes off as like weird, you know, yeah. it's, too, it's too much, but 
I guess we've all been there at some point talking to like Southwest Airlines or whatever it is. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about fatherhood because that's the, like I was saying, it's the core emotionally of, I, of this book. And I think of the path that you were on and the way that you described it earlier was, I thought a really nice way to think of it. It's like this young guy who's kind of fucking around and trying to find his way, doesn't fit in, doesn't want to fit in, wants to see the world, wants to have a big experience, wants to have a direct experience of life. And what's the line that you go back to over and over again? That's really funny about the starry machinery of the dynamo or whatever. What is that? Oh yeah. That co- that's like a lifted from a uh, howl by Alan Ginsberg. He's got something about this starry dynamo and the machinery of night. And so like, <laughs> The character Kevin's just latched onto that. And like, he's like, that's what I'm going to go find, you know, no matter what he's doing. And even, yeah, even though when he's a, a 25 year old dad changing diapers, he's still holding on to that starry dynamo, but like, it's just gone. Okay. <laughs> Let's pause for a moment because I often will defend the beats. I defend the hippies on this show and I defend the beats on this show and in my life, not because they are without sin. Like I get it. It was a bunch of dudes who were often self-indulgent and, Uh, ridiculous and mean and there's all sorts of ways to criticize but the basic project at its best of beat literature i think is undervalued yeah i mean i think i i definitely have a love-hate relationship with the beats i mean and it started with love you know and uh i mean i you know when i read on the road i was just like this is it this is the this is the book this is the game changer (laughs) and then you know i luckily like was friends with really like smart intelligent feminist women who are like what happened to the women in that book and i was like oh (laughs) good question you know so then it's sort of like okay what's the good here and what's the bad and they were men who were product of the 50s who were just like women were an afterthought and that's obviously you know deeply toxic thinking but yeah the striving for to you know not take capitalism as the be all end all and to go find the meaning of life. That is a noble thing. And, you know, they are, a lot of them are um, readers of, you know, Buddhist literature. And it, so I, I think they, they pointed me to really, in really good directions. Um, right. And I think maybe like, you know, it, at this point in my life to the, you know, to some extent accepting their faults, I, I, I do appreciate them again. You know, I've kind of come full circle maybe and Me like, too. okay, th- there was good there, you know, um, with a lot of bad and just being able to see both at the same time. And um, yeah, I, I don't I know. Think that, I think that's an actually, a, it's a good point. And it's a normal path that I think a lot of us take with our heroes. Yeah. Where like you love somebody when you're young, you read like on the road when you're 17 years old or something and it blows your mind and it, you know, you feel like you want to emulate that course in life. And then, you know, five years later, you've read a bunch of other stuff and now you're sort of like rolling your eyes at your past self and it, you sort yeah. of like hate your hero. And then you get to be like 46 and you're like, actually, you know what? I, I have some nostalgia for this now. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. It just seems like a, maybe a natural course of things and like a common course of things to go around in these loops. But yeah. And I've thought about like, what what is the element that's missing for me from Kerouac? And I think maybe it's just like, uh, there's a little bit of self-seriousness, like a little bit, like not enough, like laughter undercutting it maybe and so that's maybe that's like part of what the redheaded pilgrim i wanted to do is like okay what if someone set out on that path but there's like it's you know where does on the road meet napoleon dynamite like where's the humor where's the like (laughs) ridiculousness where is the like laughing at your own quest but also still believing in it you know and and i think so hopefully like i wrote a book that that like is inspired by those things but is also kind of making fun of it but not to the extent of like throwing it under the bus it's like okay there was value there, but like, let's all be a little self-aware as we do it. Hopefully. Yeah. Kerouac was not a funny writer. He was so, no. sin- so sincere and yeah. uh, so like serious. There's, I'm trying to think of any joke in it. I don't know if there's any. <laughs> yeah. And, maybe, and what like, happens when, when, you know, Kerouac want, needs to change a diaper? Like we don't read that chapter, right, <laughs> you know? Right. And maybe he didn't change your diaper. I don't know. I actually am terrified of thinking about how he would have written about changing it. <laughs> that would have been too much. I would have been like, dude, okay, we, we get it. Yeah. The, the feces is infinite or whatever. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think the same way I think of maybe some of the, like the lost generation writers I had a similar kind of, I've had similar sort of relationship with that part of my reading history where it's like loved them when I was young and then sort of rolled my eyes and then came back around but like you say, not super funny. 
yeah not super funny any of them that i can think of like hemingway can accord you know occasionally like make a like a dry crack or something in one of his books but i don't think fitzgerald's super funny yeah why is it so odd? it's so rare it's so odd maybe like maybe it has something to do with critical distance you know like the beats yeah. had to do their thing and take it really seriously so that you and i could mock it or something <laughs> i don't know I, I guess there's always been you know different strains you know like melville is not funny but mark twain is funny you know so like I, you know american literature kind of splits into and maybe american literature didn't take the, the humorous as seriously or something i don't know but uh you know and i think vonnegut until he wrote slaughterhouse five was really like looked down on like oh you're a funny sci-fi writer like eye roll and yeah. so i and i think maybe writers still are afraid to be funny because they're they think they won't be taken seriously because of that and i don't know but to me those are the those are the books i love reading so those are the ones i want to i want to write but yeah i feel too like if you think about your favorite funny writers then you have like a favorite book by that funny writer and then you look at other books and maybe they're not as funny. I'm trying to think of like writers who are consistently across like their entire collection of books. It seems like it's hard to sort of capture that lightning in a bottle over and over again, or maybe yeah. you just use the same voice over and over again, but it's like, it's impossible to replicate, right? Like you do, yeah. you do a fear and loathing in Las Vegas and then like fear and loathing on the campaign trail. Isn't as, isn't the same, you know, it's, yeah. got, it's got its moments, but it's not the same. Like, uh, I don't know enough. I mean, I've read Twain, but it's been forever and I haven't read it all, but I'm wondering how it would hold up if I sat down and like read it in consecutive order or something. Same with Vonnegut, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Twain's funny anymore, you know, and maybe that's the thing is like humor is often like very pinned to the moment, you know, like, uh, right. I'm not sure, but, uh, yeah, I don't, Vonnegut's usually funny, but like, he's got his duds, his bad books and yeah. Well, we all do. Right. I mean, yeah. it, you would think, I mean, who, who hits a home run every time up to bat, but what about uh, fatherhood? I mean, you talked about having to suddenly confront that reality. And like you said, you have to change a diaper and suddenly shit is real, <laughs> uh, <laughs> figuratively and literally. And you've got to take care of this preacher. Uh, all of a sudden, a lot of the whims that you were indulging previously sort of go out the window, right? And how did it change like in your personal life, you know, not on the page in Redheaded Pilgrim, but how did it change your relationship to your creative aspirations like did you get more serious about it but also have to sort of scale back or how did it work yeah i mean you know in terms of like it's really easy to be an anti-capitalist when you're uh 24 and single and only need, you know back then you know i that my rent was like 250 bucks a month or something it was really easy to to live and then suddenly when i was a parent that just it wasn't easy anymore and the the reason for capitalism suddenly made a lot of sense like oh this child needs to have their needs met and that's the most important thing in the world which means i have to make enough money to meet this child's needs so it's a huge shift in my brain and uh and you know when, when my when my kid was born and it was just a, a, a huge pivot and uh but i also that's kind of when i got serious about being a writer at the same time i think because i was so scared of losing that part of myself that I would just cram in an hour of writing or two hours of writing when, you know, it was often like after my kid went to sleep and I just stole the time when I could, I was writing terrible things at the time. I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't even submitting stories or anything. I was just writing on a typewriter with like a blanket over it. So it wouldn't make, wake up the baby and, you know, and just writing and trying to like, hold on to that part of myself. Um, Cause my life suddenly felt so different. Like the other 22 hours where I wasn't writing felt, like not my life. Cause I think that's what happens, right? Like you don't matter anymore when you have a kid to some extent, all that gets, you know, the pause button gets pressed if you're a good parent. And I was trying to be a good parent. So. And it also is, I mean, this is sort of a simplistic way of thinking about it, but it really is the end of childhood. It's the end of youth when yeah. you, you become a parent, like whatever vestiges of your youth that you were hanging on to sort of fall away. Right. It yeah. Feels that way anyway. And I think it's important to point out that you can write books or you can apprentice or do what you need to do if you're only doing an hour a day uh, for whatever reason it's easy to trick yourself into thinking like you need a full eight hours <laughs> yeah um, but that's not how books are written and i think for people listening who might be early in their journey or whatever if all you can muster is a half an hour a day or an hour a day i think there's a real power in doing that hour every day right yeah. or, cl or close to it um 
that's what I'm telling myself lately anyways, because I'm trying to work on a book and I'm doing it in like an hour or two at a shot. And that's, that's what I've got, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, who's got it? I mean, if you've got eight hours a day, bless you, but that's not the norm. Yeah. And I, I think that was a revelation for me too, was like the daily writing, the ritual of it was more productive than, you know, taking up one day and just trying to get everything done in one day. It's like the, the, the habit of writing, I think is like the most important thing, which can, you know, but I think, you know, at least during the, it was mostly the first year, year and a half when my, you know, our baby wasn't sleeping and it was just like, um, I think it's just mental fatigue at that point is, you know, you get that one hour and then you just stare at the page and you're like, are you kidding me? Like I'm supposed to be creative. That still counts. That still counts. (laughs) It does count. Yeah. It's that daily self punishment and just showing up and you know what you you show up and then sometimes you do have a, you have a day where you get some stuff done, you know, you get something down that you feel satisfied with. And then there are those frustrating days where you write garbage or get frustrated and delete, you know, 10 pages or whatever. And that's part of it. Right. Yeah. Well, I, and I, I mean, I would argue that sometimes writing garbage is more productive, you know, like I think success, it like comes from writing a lot of garbage, right? Because when it's garbage, you have to look at it like, why didn't that work? Why is that so terrible? And then you have to learn, right? You edit it. Oh, it's still bad. And, and when something good comes out, you're like, I have no idea how that happened, but I know it's good, you Mm -hmm. know? And so I don't know. I think failure is like wonderful, just in the sense that like, that's that's when I'm like, okay, that's that, that didn't work. This is why it doesn't work. I get, I'm learning something. So yeah, now we move on to the next. So speaking of moving on to the next, you've got. I mean, I don't mean to uh, rush you here because you're just <laughs> celebrating the the publication of the Redheaded Pilgrim. But do you have a sense of the next project? Do you have a sense of the next several projects? Do you have a sense of like the overall project that you're undertaking here? And like, do you have like long term goals like that? Like, how do you conceive of what you're up to creatively? in that sense. Yeah. Well, I'll have a short story collection called horse girl of fever coming out with clash next year. So that's, but that's like already basically written. It's, you know, it's the, I might add one or two stories, but I'm excited about that coming out in the world. But in terms of the new thing I'm going to write next, I've got, you know, maybe 20,000 really disorganized words of something. And I, I think I'm starting to understand like where it's going. I think it's going to be kind of auto fiction adjacent in a similar way to, to this book, but it's going to be, you know, deeper into adulthood and, you know, probably dealing with a lot of the same issues, but in particular death, I think it's going to be like, it's going to be like, I think the redheaded pilgrim was my like optimistic trying to find the meaning of life, losing my virginity book. And this is going to be maybe the death book. At least that's, that's what I'm thinking right now. The Um, death book. Really wallowing in the death book. It's going to be really, but, but it'll be funny. I promise. (laughs) All right. Yeah. And the story collection too is in a comedic mode. Yeah, yeah. The story collection, I mean, it's it's a lot of like the work that led to my voice, you know, um, short stories I published along the way, but most of them are, I think all of them are kind of in the same voice, that funny voice. So the stories that are going to be in this collection are stories, that, like the stories that you referred to earlier that preceded Cult of Loretta, are they, are they in there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so okay. a lot of them were before, yeah, you know, probably four or five that happened before the Cult of Loretta and then the ones I've written since. Okay. Well, I'm so glad to meet you and to get a chance to talk to you. I've been a fan from afar for a while and have been looking forward to this one. Congratulations on its publication. And hopefully, the, you know, the, the process of finding a wider readership. I think that, you know, readers who pick this one up um, will then have the pleasure of picking up Cult of Loretta and then getting to look forward to the story collection. So just kudos to you for getting the work done and for all that you have going on it's been fun well i appreciate it i'm a a big fan of the show and it's amazing to be on here and yeah i appreciate your support 